Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Lab. I am your host, Aladdin, and our distinguished speaker for today is Patrick Potish, um, who is currently a professor at the computer science at uh, Potsdam University in Germany and is a chair of the Human Computer Interaction Lab. His research interest in personal fabrication and did a lot of research in natural user interfaces since 1996, if that's correct. Um, I guess, yeah. The title of his talk is a 20 year mission for personal fabrication and a live demo of year four. The talk will be roughly an hour followed by a brief question and answer, but feel free to ask your questions in the middle as well. Uh, I will hand over to Patrick. Thank you so much for joining us. Great, so thanks for having me. Um, yeah, cool. Um, who is a PhD student actually? Anyone? Okay, cool. Um, cool, and uh, who's, who's in VR? Who's doing virtuality? Okay, oh, okay, some people, uh, okay. Tamil, what are you doing? Like there was at least one hand that didn't go up, so I'm kind of curious what. Uh... So Tamil is doing sensor fusion, Tamil. Um... Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm doing gesture interaction and uh, creating new interaction with technology. Interaction uh -huh. All right, cool. Well, um, so I mean, I got, I'm actually, let me, let me, sh let me start by showing, <laughs> not me, but the people around me. Um, let me share my screen here. So these are the people, these are the, well, these are the people I'm working with right now. The, the three more senior students is Thais Kalman, who was about to graduate, but he works on FAB, and then Rob works on FAB. Um, but Sebastian Mavetsky, he's done, he's done uh, work on virtuality. So that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a link. And that, it looks like Jotaro is kind of stepping into his, in just footsteps. So there's like two people in this group who are kind of interested in VR right now. But um, these are people I used to work with. So today when I talk about, um, when I talk, oh, Zach, you've got a question or? Uh, Zach, I see your hand being up with you. Yes? Maybe you uh, want to sure Um, I, 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 I didn't hear a question, so it's just audio didn't. Okay, so if, if there's anything, just feel free to just speak out right away. Um, um, and check your check your connection, maybe. Um, so these are people I used to work with. Um, Christian Holtz is a uh, assistant professor now at ETH. Uh, we did a lot of multi touch stuff kind of back in the days when we were interested in more in devices. Uh, Stephanie is a professor at MIT now. She was the first student I worked with on, on uh, fabrication. This was kind of how we all started. It was sort of, we, we goofed around with, with the laser cutter and then we're like, oh, that seems interesting. Maybe we want to do more of this. Uh, Pedro is a professor, an assistant professor now at the uh, University of Chicago. We did electrical muscle stimulation together. You might've seen, you know, gluing electrodes all over the body. Um, Long Pan is actually a professor at the, uh, at the Taiwan National University now. And we did virtuality together, specifically how to help uh, with something called um, <clears throat> um, helping people with physical drops. And, uh, and most recently, Alex is a professor now at the University uh, of Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, we've been also working on fabrication together. So that's some sort of an overview of where this comes from. Because when I, when I talk about things today, that's, that's, uh, these are the people whose work I've shown to a certain extent. But I've actually picked two things. I'm going to show this system here called Cube. And um, I'm actually going to talk mostly about a paper that, um, that like I'm, I happen to be first author on. So this happens very rarely if you're kind of uh, more, a more senior person that you write a first author paper. But um, occasionally it happens. So maybe as a background. So um, a couple of years ago, I did a I did some sort of a survey. I was sitting at my favorite conference, which is the WIS conference. And I asked, 
Hiroshi Ishii, Andy Wilson, um, you know, whoever, like Junreki Modo, like the, this, what I would think of the senior people of the field, some questions about, about research. And, um, and one of them gave me a really surprising answer. He says, he said, I'm, 50, I'm 52 now. I think it was Bradford Paley. And he said, I'm 52 now. And I think I'm good enough for like another two projects before I retire. And so I really want to make them count somehow, which I thought was a very interesting perspective because um, I'm a couple of years younger, at least I was at the time. And I hadn't really thought about how to plan out my career. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think it's a really interesting idea somehow to think of yourself as a limited resource and to kind of plan a little bit of what you want to do with your research life. And so <clears throat> uh, I was a research scientist at Xerox Park and then at Microsoft Research and I spent 10 years in the S. And, uh, and uh, so I, I've written like a lot of kind list papers. Um, in, in this, it's not a hundred, but I think of them as a hundred, it's like 60 or something like that. So it's better a, a, a larger number of them. And I think of these as one year pro projects each. Um, and so I got kind of tired of that at some point. So I wanted to, I turned to the faculty position uh, where I now graduated 10 students. And I tend to think of these as 10 people with 10 person years each. So going from a hundred, from 100 one year projects, I went to 10, 10 year projects. And, um, and I'm going to tell you about my 100 year project today. Obviously, it's not 100 years, but 100 person years. So it's, you know, that's some sort of a, um, I think that's an interesting way of kind of um, going through my career somehow to kind of go up to like fewer and larger projects somehow. And happy to talk about that as well. All right. So let me use the first 30 minutes to talk about personal fabrication. So, <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of fantastic new machines. You see, um, just a quick check. How many of you have actually ever 3D printed? Okay, so it's a familiar technology at this point, right? Um, so you got things like, you know, um, you know, ultimakers and stuff like that. Yes, inkjet sintering, continuous liquid interface production. These are the super fast machines that, that print you know, 10 centimeters in six minutes. Um, and you know the number of publications is going up. So at first glance, when they think that you know person fabrication is brand new, and the answer is it's kind of a little bit shocking if you go back and think about when this started, you realize that the first 3D printer, printer was was made in '87. Um, and if you go further back, like my favorite machine is, uh, is laser cutters, and uh, they were invented in '65. This is a model year from '75. But if you look at it, it looks exactly like the machines we have today. So there has been no progress in terms of the hardware since. The technology has been around for decades. What's going on then? How come that we actually started talking about in HCI, that we started talking about fabrication, you know, kind of around 2009. And the interesting thing is uh, 2009 was not the beginning of anything. It was the end of something. And that was the end of the patent on fused deposition modeling. So one of the technologies that make, that make 3D print, which is the simplest process, is, is you have a little glue gun on a robot, robotic arm, if you will, like a gantry, move some sort of a head around out, out of that head, you squeeze out liquid plastic. And that was patented uh, 20 years prior to that. In 2009, that patent expired. And so the result of this was that the mach machines that were around 100K um, then dropped to something like 3K that year. Um, a couple of clever people uh, who founded MakerBot had observed the patent situation and they understood that they would expire around that time and they started creating their machine, the MakerBot. And, um, and because of that price drop, they now address a completely different market than before. And you know, people like you know, some labs and some, some private tech enthusiasts uh, would just go out and buy some of these things. And uh, a lot of publications, it, it, it's, it's almost embarrassing, I would say, you know, the, the research community kind of had ignored that space largely. And then was, oh, this is an interesting mass phenomenon, because at least the CHI conference and the WISC conference, they tend to look at something called discretionary use, which is, this, which is use, you know, when people choose to use something, it's like non-industry use, if you will. So, but if you go further back, you see that like before that transition happened from industry to what I call tech enthusiast use, you know, there, there's already been like you know, four decades of, of something going on here. So, so what's interesting when people talk about person fabrication, person fabrication was indeed novel. It's just not the fabrication that was novel, but the personal, right? 
So similar to how you know person computing in the you know started with whatever the Xerox Alto or whatever you, you want to pick as a machine. Um, Computing was obviously around, but the idea of using computers for individual use as for personal augmentation, that was a, was a new idea. So what I'm interested in uh, is this year. So a lot of technologies, when they go from industry use, they, they can enter a tech enthusiast use, but the key question is, will they enter a consumer phase? And with consumers, I mean, everyone who kind of, um, well, to a certain extent, it's an ill-defined term. It means not industry use and not that tech enthusiast use. So people actually want to solve a problem, um, but are not using, using it on an industrial scale. So for example, I am a consumer when it comes to toasters. I have one here, given that I'm in my kitchen. Let me show you. There it is. There's my toaster. It's an appliance. It costs like whatever, 30 bucks. Um, um, I have not premeditated the use very much. It's a, it, I have a problem, which is someone toast in the morning and uh, I can buy standardized toast that I pop in. It tends to work out in 99 of 100 cases. And if my toaster should ever fail me, I will you know, throw it out and buy a new one. Uh, I have no particular affiliation with my toaster. I'm not enthusiastic about it. It just makes toasts. And so um, that's interesting about the consumer phase is that the consumer phase tends to attract you know, between a thousand and a million times more people than tech enthusiasts. So um, if that should ever happen, if, if, uh, if fabrication, person fabrication should make it to some sort of a consumer phase, that means we would have hundreds of millions of new users, which I call consumers, and that would give the field tremendous impact. By the way, I mean, for VR, you can ask yourself exactly the same question. And I'm sure this comes up in lab meetings from time to time, which is, will virtual reality ever make it to that, to that, uh, phase where like everyone has a VR headset. Will you ever sit on the metro train and everyone around you will wear a VR headset? And is that a plausible scenario? Is that absurd? Is that obvious? You know, any of these things. It's a good discussion to have because in some ways as a researcher, even though you're working on something um, that is supposed to be free in an environment and, and, and so on, in some ways, the idea of research is that one day you're supposed to have an impact, right? And that impact can say, well, my impact is having that paper at the conference. But ideally, that impact would be that some future generation looks at you and says, um, you know, that that in, in like whatever, 2022, you know, you published that paper that really enabled that and really kind of changed the world somehow. And changing the world would mean at some point that a very, very large number of people would start using the technology that would not have used the technology otherwise. So, so. One of the first questions, and I'm sure this is the same question that you guys that get about the R, people would say, I mean, yeah, so Patrick, so what will these consumers do with personal fabrication, right? I mean, why would it be worth it? You know, what, what's going on here? And then like, well, the obvious easy, and I, I don't know if you've never seen my slides, I use green for good and like true and orange for like questionable. So if you see an orange frame in my slides, that means, well, that may not be true. So, um, so I say easy, just look at what makers are doing today, right? The tech enthusiasts, let's, let's, they're already doing it. So let's see what they're doing. So you go to Thingiverse and, um, and you, you check out what's going on and you see, aha, there it is. You know, what's the purpose of 3D printing? Well, it's to print master Yoda. Um, and then you ask yourself, well, will that merit like a billion new users? Is that, you know, will that get people excited? And the answer is, no, it will not, <laughs> of course not. Um, but the point is, um, the interesting thing is that I think makers are exactly not the people to look at. The same way that you guys in this call are not representative for virtual reality because you're doing virtual reality because you're excited about it. You're tech enthusiasts and researchers to certain, I'm guessing that every, every researcher also some sort of a tech enthusiast at the same time. Um, um, but you're not representative for the people around you. So in some ways, asking you what VR is going to be about is kind of pointless because you're the least representative people for it. So let me tell you what's different about makers or tech enthusiasts. Tech enthusiasts would have to say something like, I have a 3D printer, let me find something interesting to do with it. And they're looking for a technical challenge and they experience a the technical challenge as rewarding and the outcome doesn't matter all that much. Now note the difference compared to what I just said about my toast, right? Consumers, outcomes matter, period, right? Outcomes, outcome matters. And in the case of my toast, you know, I, I would like, I would prefer user experience that is like, you know, pushing that one button is pretty much as much effort as I'm willing to put in. 
And if the toast should not be the way I want it, I'm just out. I'm not interested. So it's pretty much exactly the opposite of what a maker does, right? As a consumer, I'm not interested in the technical challenge of getting my toast in just the right angle or whatever it is. Um, my, my uncle used to have a toast that actually required, that didn't have a timer, you had to flip it yourself. And that was already too much challenge for me. Uh, interestingly, I think consumers are much more like uh, industry users for that matter. So industry users and consumers try to solve an existing problem in the least amount of time uh, with the least amount of money. And so in some ways, if we just ignored the makers, it would make things easier because then we would look at industry users and they would get some sort of a sense, right? So um, that would give you a better perspective for where this is going and why, right? That's not where 3D printing is going, like impossible gears, sure. You know, that's in, in, in exclusively for the purpose of because we can. So if makers are not a good way of predicting where things are going, well, the question is what is? and um, so we wrote, a, we wrote this longer article um, called Person Fabrication, 140 pages, where I try to answer that question, where is this going? And, uh, and the, my approach here is, the question is, well, maybe we can find a field that's similar, right? And so we first, and then we can see how that other field developed. And then maybe we can, we can find out how these fields generally develop. And then uh, based on that, maybe we can say where FAP is going. And for that matter, if you appreciate that approach, you know, I'm guessing that this could work from VR as well. You could ask yourself, where is VR going? So maybe we can find other fields that are similar. So the question is, well, what does similar mean? So let's find out what is the essence of, you know, of, of fabrication. And so here's my, my perspective on this. I would say like, well, you know, typically, as an example, if I have a physical problem, I have a physical machine, that special purpose machine that solves that. So for example, I, I printed a cup here, but it could also be a, it could be a key for that matter. So I don't know if you ever lost your key. If so, you would probably recognize that sound. You got a, the original key, you put it into, into one half of the machine and you have a blank. You know, it's just the same as the key, but it's, it's lacking that specific pattern. And this thing can just translate and rotate. So it scans, use, use it to scan one key and, and dri drive like a mill bit into the other, into the, into the blank. And that makes the copy of the key. I don't know if you recognize, who recognize the sound? I mean, very characteristic. Okay, anything like me, then you've done this a bunch of times in your life. So, so, okay, that's the old workflow. If a mechanical problem, you find a mechanical solution for it using a highly specialized machine. All good, perfect idea. New workflow, let's 3D scan the thing. By the way, you know it's analog because if you do this a bunch of time, the key won't fit anymore, right? Because you're making copies of copies and every copy is, loss, is lossy. So at some point it stops working. So how about a great new workflow? Let's do a 3D scan, solve whatever needs to be done in computer science in this making copy is a trivial problem. And then I 3D print it. And then I get my mechanical solution out. Looks like this. So instead of having one machine, I have two machines. And at first you think about, well, that's stupid. You know, why would it be beneficial to have two machines when a single machine can make a copy of my key? And I think you're right. Uh, but there's something interesting happening along the way, which is in the process, you've created a cup that's a virtual cup. And that virtual cup or virtual key has interesting qualities because now that's that's in my land. I'm a computer scientist. So as a side effect, we created, we created a key that is virtual. And that actually, if I want to, I can inflict the entire power of computer science on it if I feel like doing that. So for example, I can stick it into BitTorrent or put it on my website, which is an idiotic thing, of course, in this case to do. And then I can have a million people copy this. And so because of this virtual cut, like the, 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 uh, the process is, is idiotic if I just scan it and use it exactly to make one print, then there's no benefit over the, over the mechanical machine. But I can do other things with it. So for example, I can decide to not print it right away, but to store it and print it some other time. So for example, here's, an, here's a historical example. Um, if you happen to be a proud owner of a 1974 Volkswagen Golf and your driver anything like me, then maybe you kind of destroy the bumper cap from time to time. And uh, you might want to get a new one, but Volkswagen is actually not that enthusiastic about selling that to you because they're selling only a bunch of them every year. So they have to have, you know, they have to run a batch. Injection molding is only efficient for 5,000 and more. So maybe they make 5,000. It takes them like a gazillion years to sell those. Um, 
And uh, when they do that, it has to be very expensive because they have to store it and retrieve it and, and all that stuff. It's not a good business for them. And it's definitely not a good business for you because it's very, very expensive. So if you switch to on-demand printing of these things, that's certainly a more efficient way. And then at some point you find yourself that you're creating a computer science solution to a mechanical engineering problem, right? Even though at the end of the day, you're getting a physical bumper cap, the process you're doing is just like when you download a song from, from uh, well, it depends on where it's gonna be printed. Maybe it's just on demand, maybe it gets fabricated at the fab lab in your street. Maybe as you're fixing the car, maybe it gets printed on your own 3D printer. That's more a matter of, of a legal issue, like who prints it. So you get some sort of what you see is that you get something that used to be a some sort of a physical process and now becomes some sort of an, an SAP problem somehow. But the more important, the more exciting thing is actually that, that there could be any type of software in between. So one of the best things that ever happened to blind people is the iPhone, which is kind of unintuitive because the iPhone, as the name almost suggests, is designed for eyes, you know, with a big screen. But the key thing is that once you have a platform such as the iPhone, you can change anything you want by updating software. So the iPhone is great for blind people because it has this wonderful feature called voiceover, but also because you have an app store with a million applications. And whenever you have a new need, rather than buying a new phone, you actually go to the app store, download a new, a new solution, and you have the solution right away. And for you as a developer, you can actually develop new software rather than developing a new phone. Developing a new phone would be a spending process that most of us could not afford or don't want to go through. But making a new piece of software is quick, quickly done, easily sold. It's a win-win for everyone. So having a platform, that's what a platform does for you. So in this case, if you want instead, if you want something that repairs 3D models, well, you just buy yourself on the app store a repair software that looks up maybe the original building plans, you, um, and then you repair things. And there's 50 things to do that way. So in some way, it's the transition from like specialized hardware to a platform. And I call this the ADDA pattern for it because I think that's enabled by anything that has a scanner and a printer. So AD meaning analog digital. You have something in the physical world that you make digital. You spend time in the digital world with the full power of digital and you need a machine that converts it back into, into, into analog. So that's what I think of as, as characteristic as, 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 as this, as the space of fabrication. So now I can use that and ask around, well, what other technologies have gone through this ADDA pattern in the past and how have they done? Well, having worked at Xerox Park, I'm intimately familiar with desktop publishing. And if you ever submitted a paper, maybe the paper chairs ask you to submit a camera ready. Did, have you ever been asked to submit a camera ready of your, of your paper? Can anyone tell me where the camera is? Does anyone know where the camera is? Huh? It's a metaphor, yes, for being ready for public. I don't know. Yes, yes. But I mean, there used to be a camera, right? At some point, you submitted some sort of print stuff. And then this was, I think, you know, I'm, I'm almost too young to know. But like, um, I think they cut the paper and they put the, the page numbers on and stuff like that and put a sheet of glass over it. And then I took a photograph of the whole thing. And that became the, the that, that went into repro. So there was a camera. So when I asked you for a camera, ready, I mean, that camera hasn't been there like, you know, 30 years at this point. Um, I, as as uh, Aladdin kind of uh, pointed out, um, yes, my first paper was in 96. So I still had to submit six copies of a videotape. That was the last year. So um, six copies of the paper and I think six copies of the of a videotape somehow. Did that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I might have submitted the paper copies actually. So you know, all that went away. So the, the word remains, but today, I mean, obviously with the advent of, of scanners and printers, namely, you know, Gary Stockwell and when invented laser printing with that part, you know, this loop was closed and, and boom, you know, I mean, the, not, not, the printing industry completely changed, you know, trillion dollar business, huge, you know. Um, music production, I, I, I had like CD readers and writers because they were digital, but today, obviously this is all, has, has gone beyond that. But at this point, you know, no one has tapes moving back and forth anymore, right? Uh, Dick Sharp at Park uh, invented um, digital video editing, which was funny because the people threatened to fire him for wasting company resources on doing silly stuff of him, inviting artists at night, um, ripping frames of videotape, editing on a, an Alto computer and writing it back in the morning. You know, he all but lost his job for doing that bullshit stuff, which also happens to be a many, many billion dollar business in the end. So these are examples where like ADDA things came in the past. You know, this was all done with tapes and analog and stuff like that. And at some point, someone 
figured out how to digitize this and the world was never the same. And in some ways, even text you could say was, was that way. So every time we see this ADBA pattern, I think the world thoroughly changed. Some analog field became a digital field and arguably a subfield of computer science. That's how I want to think of it because I'm a computer scientist. Or you can say that computer science became a subfield of them. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of new jobs were created. And I think these were meaningful events. And I think that what we're seeing today with personal fabrication is kind of the advent of that happening to physical matter. Now, don't get me wrong. This is already happening in industry. People have used to it in this industry for a long time. But I think what we're about to witness is that happening on a very big scale. And by the way, again, if you want to make that talk more interesting for yourself, just substitute virtual reality here and, and ask yourself what that means. You know. And, and by the way, I mean, VR and FAP are kind of related in some way that, I mean, VR is some sort of a transient way of doing it, which is fast and real time, has lots of benefits. And FAP is the persistent way of doing it, which has the benefit that the result is physical and you can actually put a physical load on it, right? So if I design a guitar, I can play it. If I design a plane, it flies. Um, but VR um, certainly has lots of other benefits, which is you can do non-physical stuff, right? So these are both, they may be very aligned on these things. So in the case of FAP, you know, structural engineering and mechanical engineering, industrial design, all these fields will be affected by this. So how did they become, you know, trillion dollar business, these things? Well, if you look at, so in some ways the transition to consumers could only take place when consumers were enabled to perform expert tasks. So in industry, these are all people with like, you know, five or six years of university degrees here. They do certain things. Then there's some tech enthusiasts who are just goofing around. And at some point, people without any degree start to do these things. And so we, we kind of looked at these other fields and it seems like these are the components that you need. The most important thing you need is some sort of a solid hardware and material thing that eliminates the need for skill. So my toaster completely eliminates the need for me to do anything useful with fresh bread, right? As some sort of standardized toast I can buy, a standardized toaster, my, my bread making skills with that toast are just incredible even though I did not enjoy a six year education in making toast. Um, 3D printers are not there yet, by the way, and laser cutters are definitely not. That's, I tell you because that's what I'm spending a lot of my time on right now. And the one thing you definitely need is software that inc incorporates domain knowledge. So the stuff that an expert would typically know, um, that needs the software to do. So um, I've got a phone and that phone and makes me a video editor. Like that phone shoots video, great. And then it has like, not this one, but my previous one had iMovie on it. And I can choose, I want a Bollywood style trailer. And then it tells me what clips, you know, mid-range shot goes here, long range shot goes there. And then there's my trailer, right? Again, I'm, you know, I'm not Stanley Kubrick, but I'm a consumer, right? So it make this good enough to send to my family. And the software has enough domain knowledge to know what makes a good trailer, you know, at least in, in rough shapes. And I can do it. So these two things together are essential. Um, if you care, I mean, we spend a lot of time on interactivity. Interactivity you need if you have a domain that requires the physical artifact as a preview. It's some sort of a niche sub problem, but it's an interesting one. And then you need some sort of the driver level stuff. So, so domain knowledge is the knowledge about the field and the machine knowledge is also very important because that kind of solves the problems that the mach new machinery creates. So you, you slicers and nesters and all these things, the stuff that allows people to just deal with the new technology efficiently. These are the things you need. So if you would take that for, uh, if you, uh, <clears throat> what would it take for personal fabrication to transition to consumers? Exactly the same thing. I think that's the pattern you see for all of these things. Um, so that's what you need to go enable. And that's what we kind of wrote up on 140 pages, you know, th these different things. So you have essentially, you know, you have um, the hardware, then you, th there's some domain knowledge that allows people to edit efficiently on these things. You may or may not have visual feedback and then it goes to the driver and it's this thing somehow. So, um, and then you can drill down to these things and say like, well, you know, what are all the different properties of 3D printers, for example, you can have and what are people working on, all good. If you really want to be fancy, you can go one level further, which is you think about the societal impact. So the hardware level kind of, this is the, the center level is the classic HCI level, if you will. And the top level is where, well, I guess mostly legal folks are living and, and advocates of sustainability. But if for once we didn't leave that to them, but we thought about that a little bit in advance, that could be cool too. So topics like sustainability and intellectual property. If you think of BitTorrent, for example, or uh, Napster, or like any of these other services, they, they completely succeeded on a technological level, but we never quite succeeded on, well, except for Spotify, if you will, 
they never quite succeeded on the legal level. So I think these are, you know, things might be worth thinking about. And again, the same will apply to virtual reality, right? There will be a point at, at which virtual reality is solved. We have like whatever 8K per, per eye resolution and, you know, all the wonderful things and lag will be even less than that or so. And like we have tracking everywhere, um, but we still haven't figured out what, what the people in suits think about the technology. So making this actual for researchers, um, here's what I've been doing with my lab. Um, and this is just the best thing I can recommend it so highly. Um, if you don't want to be creative every day, find some sort of a mapping to some other field and copy that other field. So what we've done is like, well, this is the pattern of fab. And this, we, in this case, we just took all like, you know, all the topics I just talked about together and said like, let's look at personal computing as a whole. And let's see how that, how that's been panning out. So if I want to know what's here, I'm just looking at computing as a whole and asking myself, well, what happened there? So person computing became like the 2009 event for, for, for person fabrication corresponds to 1975 in, in, um, in computing with the advent of the 8800 processor. That was the first microprocessor that was cheap enough that people could just goof around with it. And that ushered in the age of the tech enthusiasts like Steve Wozniak. Right, who were just sitting there and making wooden boxes with like solid conductive paths to make their own computers. Um, and you know, Steve Wozniak is as representative of a consumer as, as everyone in a, in a fab lab right now. Um, before that, there was some sort of an interest, industrial phase, you know, and it's always unclear how where exactly you anchor this, but you, but you have corresponding events somehow and in kind of a correspondingly long time frame where people said like the world would never need more than whatever, four or five computers and um, you know, things like that. You've heard those quotes. So, but the cool thing is that, that, that uh, personal computing has been running for longer. So I can actually look at where this is going. So if I want to know what will go here, I can see it, well, what happened here and I can see, can I transfer those ideas to fabrication? So for example, mobile computing, 1992, the part tab, 1993, the Apple Newton, which didn't quite make it, 1970, uh, 97, the first successful, commercially successful product called Palm Pilot, then IPAX and so on today, whatever, 7 billion devices, right? So huge success, this is what it was. So I can ask myself, what does that mean for FAB? And this video has unfortunately some trouble playing. Um, let me see if it works out. This is my student Thais here. This is in front of Hasselblad Institute. And in this brief walkthrough, now okay, let me see if I can rewind it and then hopefully it plays now. Nah. All right, what happens is car brakes, uh, is bike brakes here. The lamp is sagging, you know, he wants a Rojo, but the, but the, and what he needs is an Allen wrench to fix it. So he goes to his mobile phone. He looks up the corresponding model. He happens to carry a 3D printer, absurd as that sounds. He 3D prints the Allen wrench that he needs and fix the problem. And then he rides away. Wow, how absurd the fuck does that sound? Except if you happen to be old enough to ever watch Miami Vice, and I should add a picture here. Does anyone know what Miami Vice is? No, right, you've never seen that. It's a TV show from the US, from the 80s. And when people make phone calls, they make phone calls on these phones that today you wouldn't want to be caught dead with, but they were a status symbol at the time, right? They were like, if you look at my gestures, like that size of phone. I mean, like kind of, you know, if you ever saw a car phone that was kind of in that range, then people try to carry, it's just it's like half a briefcase somehow. And <clears throat> we made this printer by just buying a, a cube shaped printer and just chopping off half of that printer. And, um, is that no, like people will not carry this thing, but it turns out we can make 3D printers and laser cutters the size of a mobile phone. And that, that would be interesting. No one has tried that yet. Uh, we'll do that sometime soon. And it's an interesting question. Well, why would you ever want to carry a mobile printer with you? Well, why would you ever carry a mobile phone with you? You know, well, the reason is if you miss the bus, you want to know when the next bus comes. You don't want to go home and use your workstation to kind of query the internet to find out when the bus comes because you're not home. Right. So if you're hiking and something breaks, you want to fix it. Right. The idea that you're not thinking of a mobile printer right now is because the printers are not like you in the times of workstations. People would not have thought of like, you know, looking up the bus schedule on the go because carrying a VAX with you uh, would have made no sense. But this will actually happen. This was kind of fun. I mean, the, we, we, this was published at the WISC conference. And I think the, none of the reviewers got the idea. Everyone thought it was silly and absurd. But, you know, let's talk in 20 years. Let's see how that's going. In the 0.001% chance that I'll ever get a touring award, I think it will be for that. <laughs> because it's the most absurd things we've done so far. And then that's, you know, let's see how this goes. 
All right, let me see if I, okay, PowerPoint's back with me. So uh, I need to replace that video, I think here. Uh, PowerPoint, don't leave me. All right. Um, so here was the video, let me jump back in here. So what else was here? Well, there's cease computer supported collaborative work. Well, maybe there will be collaborative fabrication and social fabrication. There's Ubicom, maybe there will be ubiquitous fabrication, you know, and so on. So in some ways, once I've established that metaphor, like that, 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 that analogy, that, that uh, isomorphism between my field and the, and the rest of computing, I can use that to draw random inspiration. I just copy buzzwords from that time, from that time period and replace whatever word I find with fabrication and then they evaluate. Now it turns out 70% of these don't make sense, but 30% of them do make sense. And that's a very, that's a very efficient way of, of being creative for that matter. Again, I can highly recommend it. If you want to be creative, that's a good, that's a good approach. And honestly, that's kind of, that may be, uh, I'm 53, um, I've got like 15 years of official tenure ahead of me. I think this will be plenty good for the next 15 years. And it's probably plenty good for the rest of the field as well. So a lot of research questions, you just do the text replacement and you check, does that make sense? When will we get there? Well, since 2016, 3D printers have been sold at Walmart. So we must be pretty close, right? And the answer is, well, let's see. So quick check. When do you think, for, for how long do you think we have been, like computing has been ready for consumers? This takes a moment to think about. You know, what, what year would you pick? Uh, what event would you say? When, when did, when did uh, personal computing, when was it ready for consumers? Okay, everyone think of a year and I'll, I'll, I'll have you vote in a second. So who says computing was ready in the 70s for consumers? Who is the, your favorite event happened in the 80s. 80s, in the 80s it was, you know, maybe it was the, the Xerox star or the Macintosh computer, the first Mac maybe. Who says in the 90s, you know, Windows, okay, 90s, okay. Who says in the 2000s? And a lot of hands in the 90s. Who says in the 2000s, okay? So half of you say the 90s, half of you say the 2000s. So I actually, I actually pick, I tend to pick 2011, and here's the reasoning. In 2011 was the first time I could buy an iPad um, without a personal computer. So I could buy an iPad that was just the iPad, and it would, it would be, it would run off, um, I, it have an app store, so I can, I can load new applications on it in a way that doesn't get me a virus. And it was backed up by whatever iCloud. I'm, by the way, I'm not an Apple fanboy. I'm just trying to, you know, they were the first to kind of offer a product that was closest to my toaster, I would say. Like an iPad, I think it's like, you know, if you think of someone, an older person in your family, that person could probably maintain that iPad somehow without you being the canonical person to be called once a week to like, uh, mommy, there's a, oh, I'm sorry, not mommy, da daughtery or sunny. Um, there is some, there's a, the computer is telling me to do this, you know, what shall I do? And I think the iPad was the first thing where you had a chance of actually having some sort of peace of mind with your, with your mother, grandmother, father, grandfather, having this thing somehow. So, um, if you, if you, I mean, if you think about how long it's been taken between the 8800 processor and my specific event of that iPad, but you could pick a different one. In my case, I would say it's 36 years. And you can ask yourself where, you know, we, we, in the journal paper, we broke this down further, um, 36 years, a long time. So are we there? No, we're like, we're like 15 years in or something like that, right? So if everything feels a little awkward, the machine that you're buying at Walmart absolutely is not the toaster. I can, I can assure you of that. Um, so if you're a student now, by the time this happens, you'll be 60. So just to give you a sense of the time frame, in the meantime, it might be a good idea to defer judgment rather than saying like, well, has CAP delivered? Or for that matter, has VR delivered? Um, good idea, you should ask yourself, when do you think VR is gonna make? It? And how is it gonna be there? You know, how is it, what is it gonna be like? What, is, like? what does it take to get there? Actually, just if you, if you care, use the, in the last lab, lab meeting, just use those slides here and ask yourself, well, what, how does all this apply to VR for that matter? Um, okay, and I'm looking, 80s, first iPhone, yeah. Um, and the, first, the third thing is, well, if you believe it, if you like it, you could actually be part of it, right? 
Um, so, because once it has reached consumers, I mean, why are we on this call here, right? That this job is done. We, we want to stay incompetent. We want to pick the next thing that hasn't happened, but we know nothing about and research that somehow, right? So this is kind of the perfect time. It's good to know that there's still time to go because it means we're doing the right thing. We're on the right field. You know, we're researchers. We want to be here, right? If you reach the end of this, it's probably time to get off. And I know some people in VR actually were kind of shocked when like the quest came out and that stuff and the vibe and these things. They're like, wow, is it time to leave VR? You know, is it like, have we reached, is, is that the end of VR? Has it, is that the successful transition to consumers? Is like VR done at this point? Just trying to shock you. I don't think it is, but, but these are certainly worth things to discuss. We've got something at the lab we call the radical meeting every, well, it's supposed to be every four weeks, but it's more like four times a year. When we're checking if we're still in the right field, you know, how is the field developing? What should we be working on? So if you like this reasoning, um, check out um, this paper called, well, as I said, that's a 140 page roadmap um, um, by myself and Stephanie Mueller uh, on this field. And essentially the says, program. so this is Doc Engelbart. He said like, what, what can intellectual people do with computers? And he asked it in 68. And um, so he essentially defined the grand challenge of computing, of interactive computing and says, what can intellectuals do with computers? And I think for fabrication in the same vein of just copying that, I would say, well, what can intellectuals do with fab machines, right? So that's some sort of the mission of what to find out. And hopefully they will do great things, you know, the same way that computing has really exceeded expectations by many people coming together, solving great problems. Maybe people will make more efficient motors, sustainability, all kinds of energy, space elevators, whatever, that would be great. I think it's happening, the field's exploding, the number of things are exploding, sales are exploding. The machines are not quite ready, right? So my first, 3D printer was 50K, the next was 3,000. I think you can buy one for 100 right now, but they're certainly not consumer models, but the consumer pricing is starting to happen. So that's interesting. And then I think, you know, for me, it comes down to just tackling these sub challenges and actually, um, you know, that's kind of in some ways my lab agenda here. So Rob, Rob works on domain knowledge. He's done trust fat, right? He makes huge structures um, from plastic bonds and 3D prints. Um, Stephanie got her PhD thesis in reactivity. Uh, Shohei is working on what we call the last mile problem. So, so in some ways, that's, that's my roadmap between now and retirement is to do this. That's what's going on. All right. So, so much about PowerPoint. If you, if you want to ask a question, this would be a good moment before I kind of dive in and show demos. You can tell me that my broad strokes about VR are just off the mark. That would be a fun thing to say. Um, I'm making think, a long. I think VR is. Um, I can see the similarity for what you described about uh, where, where enthusiasts and uh, consumers versus uh, maker, or people who are uh, building the technology and how they have different purpose. Um, I was wondering if you. Um, so with this prediction, would it ever uh, go in a different direction that um, you completely unpredict uh, based on previous um, analogy or, or comparison? I was wondering, so in some ways, <clears throat> so far everything has gone exactly as I predicted, but I think what happens is I stop looking somehow. I mean, essentially, you know, I, we sat down, we wrote this longer paper, and I've just been working heads down since. So I'm not, I'm not thinking every day. Like I've got periods where I'm doing a lot of deep thinking and then there's periods where we just execute. And right now we're just in execution mode somehow. Um, so there's a good chance that like, um, that, that, you know, it's actually a good, a good idea. I should probably look around from time to time to see if, if it's still on track. Um, what, what I've been personally choosing as we, as I said earlier, you know, I've done 101 year projects, I've done 10, 10 year projects and I want to do 100 year project right now. That means, and we're about it, you know, if it's our 30 person years we've put in so far. Um, I just want to pick one and kind of follow this through. And we pick laser cutting for that. So my personal mission between now and retirement or maybe after retirement is to make laser cutting happen, like the whole thing. Um, so I don't know if it's, I, I'm not 100% sure I can pull it off, but I think I can. Um, so I, I personally want to make that transition happen between, uh, between tech enthusiasts or between industry, if you will, to consumers. Uh, Tamil. Uh, I have a question. 
great talk, Patrick. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is your thoughts upon so when creating personal fabrication? Uh, uh, because uh, every uh, different uh, items we use. So, for example, the car example you gave. So, it the material used for the bumper is different from the materials used for different use cases. So, uh, how where do you think the personal fabrication or like how these uh, uh, different materials or because this will be one of the challenge in future accessing uh, different materials for per, uh, uh, accessing different materials for personal fabrication. How do you think? Because yeah. So, I'm actually not too worried about the bumper cap because um, I actually, the truth is I don't know what it's made of, but I'm pretty sure that it can be made from nylon if you want that. And nylon is something you can already print from. So I think that that one works. Um, let me give you a, 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 a super broad answer. Um, if you look at the digital camera, um, I'm blanking on the name of the guy right now. It was someone at Kodak who invented the digital camera. And there's wonderful interviews with him on YouTube that you can watch. And there's someone asks him, you know, as soon as they had this idea of a digital camera, people ask him, well, I mean, so he had to keep in mind the digital camera was that size and had a tape in it, an audio tape to record the pictures. And he had to hook it up to TVs, had to work at the pictures. There's no built-in display or anything like that, right? And so he was asked, like, you know, where, where is this going to go? What are people going to do with it? What is a digital photo album going to look like? And things like that. And he said, I had no idea. But he also says, well, as you invent, other people will invent along with you. So I think what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to decompose the problem into, into groups. And it turns out for every sub problem of these, some people like Scott Hudson, for example, I mean, every Kai paper he does, and he does a lot of them. He's got like one more material. He, did, like, he does a lot of soft materials right now. He did felt printing and so felting as a, as a, and, and weaving and, you know, and all these things uh, and knitting. And, and so, um, like, I'm confident someone else will solve that one, right? So we did, it's, it's not the one, but we, we bit off somehow. Uh, I'm trying to lay things out. And I think there's a lot of like, um, but there's so much work in like, I mean, there's multi-material printing, digital material printing, where you can intermix two materials or more materials in arbitrary mixing ratios. Um, Euler Packer has put out this jet fusion thing where they essentially, it's, it's, it's sintering based. So they lay out a layer of, of powder and then they inject any types of liquids that at least their marketing people say can adjust the stiffness of the material and color and all these things. Uh, when I called them, they didn't quite have it yet, but the, um, so yeah, I, that's actually the, the, the piece I'm leaving. I mean, there's so many people like conductive materials, transparent materials, that's all super fast happening right now, it seems. Um, there was another question in the chat. Um, current 3D printing seems mostly but static parts. How do you see the person um, of electronic components will be in the future? Yeah, it's super exciting. I mean, gee, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, electronic components, there was actually, it was kind of, I would say about 10 years ago, you would see the first, probably longer than that, the first conductive stuff cracked up, but there was kind of in the mega ohm range somehow. And then there was a period of like five years where every year the, the the resistance of the, the printed stuff would go down by some factor. And now we're in the don't care range. So at this point, you can just uh, 3D print conductive paths. Now, will you 3D print conductive electronic components? Will you, um, there's some work on 3D printing um, um, diodes. Um, I think for the time being, it's gonna probably gonna be pick and place machines. Like you're gonna have some sort of repertoire of components. You're gonna 3D print you're going to pause the print, inject these components. That's where it stands right now. Um, will you 3D print like an iPhone in the hole? Maybe at some point. Who knows? I don't know. Let's see where this goes. <clears throat> All right. And we'll have more time for questions to any. Well, there's another question in the chat, maybe. Oh, it just says thank you. OK, good. Um, all right, so here's something. Let me just give you a quick demo of something called Cube. Um, and this, is, uh, this was also a Kai paper, but we just submitted the Kai paper, like, uh, I don't know, just so that people understand we're also doing research. This is, this is, this wants to be a product here. So let me make a little espresso machine mock up here. Um, uh huh, except my server. Wow, that's embarrassing. 
It might, let me see if Zoom is still alive. Yeah, okay, Zoom is very much alive. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you can see I can build in some sort of a Minecraft way. Oh, there's something interesting happened a second ago. The software felt like what I was building here was not structurally sound enough. And that's actually a paper we had at uh, Kai just last month. It does uh, real-time structural analysis and adds reinforcement if necessary, because the people we're dealing with, with may or may not be uh, all that familiar with um, those types of problems. And um, so it, it may look like it's in sort of a blocks world, but it really is not. I can actually make arbitrary adjustments to these things. Um, it's just designed to be some sort of a Minecraft paradigm because that lowers the entry barrier for people to kind of get into, get into this project. Um, but it actually gives you a much more expressive than that. Uh, we've got something called, yeah, this is an asset, I think I do. Um, so it's really designed, oops, it's really designed to, um, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, all right, here's my advertising for Cubits and Coffee. And, um, And maybe I want to add some cut up to the bottom, coffee to drain a little better. And um, maybe I want to make the looks, it looks polished. So it makes them a little longer since polish is off later. So this takes about two minutes to edit and it takes 20 minutes to fabricate. And then maybe I can go into my meeting about, um, about espresso machines with a customer within like an hour. That was the initial idea to make a super rapid prototyping system. Um, the, the reasoning why we did that way is because laser cutting is, is very fast, but it didn't have any software to go with it. Funny enough, there's a market, $300 million worth of laser cutters are sold every year. And the software they recommend is Coral Draw. Um, so that means you're doing all these little things by hand, which is just idiotic somehow. I just don't understand what that field's been doing somehow. That's, that sounds bad. Um, it's just surprising somehow. So it's clearly an industry use that field, right? Laser cutters, the idea is if you buy a laser cutter, you're supposed to kind of do these things by hand because you're obviously a trained engineer to do it. Um, but we feel like maybe more people can do these things. So when I'm happy with my model, I can see laser cut this. And um, the fun thing is now I can actually say, I don't, actually I'm kind of curious, who knows what curve is? Okay. Okay, so I'm just checking. So curve means you don't know how much material the laser cutter will burn today. So you want the parts to really, uh, to really mesh together really well. So it's, a, it's, and that's a real problem because you find yourself and if it's not, if it doesn't fit exactly, then the model will fall apart. You can't assemble anything like that. So uh, we've gone through a bunch of different iterations on this. And what we do at this point is we don't ask you for curve. We just generate 11 versions of the model. And then you get a calibration instrument that also can be cut and you can find out what the right fit is. And then by the time you're actually saving it, uh, going to the machine, um, you actually have these properties. This is the curve gauge here. So it's some sort of a strip that gets tighter to the right and you insert this thing until you find the spot where it exactly holds with the amount of force that you hope it has. And when you have this, it tells you, you know, 0.12 is your curve and then you get the model from that folder. And then you know that that model is actually gonna work, you know, perfectly well somehow. So, I just exported this and this is, it just, it just did this layout and uh, let me, so I'm downloading it right now. Let me look at that file and finder. So I can unpack this and um, what I have now is it made, as I said, it made 11 versions of this. It has this, this curve strip that I need to kind of do these things and generate a little manual as well. It tells me how to assemble this in an optimal way. Um, So these are like assembly instructions that were automatically generated in the process. 
All right, so that's the first thing we had. And for a long time, we thought of Cube as being this somehow. Um, and there's something in the chat window. Thanks for the great talk, I believe. Okay, what's a small size object that Cube software can design? Can I do miniatures? Um, no. Um, can you do it? Um, it's just not the scale. I mean, the small scale, I think, is in sort of a centimeter range. Um, I'll show you in a second what we're building with it. Can it do miniatures? Which one field using uh, circuit? Um, I'm not sure I get the sentence completely. Which one field using circuit cutters? Uh, Louise, if you want to uh, make the second question more precise, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll rephrase. I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, so we, we're doing this with schools right now. They're wonderful early adopters. And here's a couple of things. Let me show you some of the things we're working on. Let me show you the one I'm most proud of right now, which is not complete, but we're doing it right now. We, we built guitars with it. And um, the software is very fast. So I, it's fast enough to actually use it um, in class. Um, and I can do a whole series of projects. So rather than saying we're assembling a guitar, people design the entire, like, the entire guitar by themselves. But in order to get there, I'm subdividing this in some sort of a Dr. Seuss manner. If you ever, I don't know if you know Dr. Seuss, it's a kids, American kids author, and he's written things like Green Eggs and Ham. And the idea is, do you like Green Eggs and Ham? I do not like Green Eggs and Ham. I do not like them Sam I am. And then would you like them in the house? Would you like them with a the mouse? I do not like them in the house. I do not like them with a the mouse. I do not like Green Eggs and Ham. I do not like them Sam I am. And so every time there's a question and the, but the rejection answer always uh, repeats everything that was said before. So as a kid, you have the joy of repeating something that you already know how to do. If you have kids, this is awesome stuff. You, you need to read this, it's very good. And so what we're trying to do here is I'm decomposing the question of the guitar. So if I just had to explain the guitar, it takes a while because everything is actually at a very specific position for a very specific purpose. But because the software is so fast, I'm doing a whole series of, 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 of instruments and every, pro, every instrument is designed to ask, ask a new question. So, the first one is just how to suspend the string. So I'm just making something that holds a string in space. And what, what happens if you play a string that's held by this frame? Does anyone, can anyone guess what's, so you hear it, it's cool, it works. What's the problem with it? There's no symphony or um, you cannot. <laughs> well, this, I mean, obviously there's only one string, but so the, the first thing is you don't, it's not very loud. And the reason is that a string can only excite a, a small number of air molecules. And so what you need is um, either the resonance body on electronic pickup. Um, and so the next thing you could do is, well, let's, let's add a resonance body. Now what happens here is there's something called the bridge and that transfers this, the vibration onto the body. And then now the entire surface of that box is vibrating and that can excite more air molecules. So it gets much louder, right? You've seen this, if you take something that like little little thing, you push it against a big uh, wooden surface, it gets loud that moment. Then the next thing is I want to hold this thing. So now I want to have a neck. I want to move the resonance body to one end of the instrument. And I'm getting a neck. So now I've got a structural problem. So now I, I talk about bridge construction, stuff like that. The next thing is um, I would like to play chords. So I'm, I'm adding a fretboard. So now I'm talking about different types of tuning. Um, I can electrify this thing. I'm making it bigger. I make it, you know, add steel strings, now it's different types of enforcement. And when you're all done, then everyone builds their own guitars based on, the, on, on what they learned. So at this point, when they go through this curriculum, at this point, they have learned why everything in the guitar is where it should be. And um, you have a fair chance of actually designing a guitar that kind of makes sense. Um, that's what we're doing. So um, other things we've done is other workshops we've run. Oops, let me just go back here. Um, that's not what I want to do. Oh, this one here. Um, so we've, bu we've built simpler things with people. We've built like cajons. Uh, here's a workshop with speakers that we just ran at a school. Um, and I don't think of that as being particularly limited to schools, but this is just a, a great first audience. So we built, you can see this here. We had like uh, 25 kids. Oh, this was the best here. My daughter, this is my daughter. And, um, and um, uh, we may, we've got a version from foam for it that is, that is uh, not as, as folded. And so uh, she made, she's six and she made her own speaker and it worked and it was just a really fun experience somehow. Um, very proud daddy moment. Uh, so you have the kids and we'll build them. 
So we're actually deploying this with the school right now. Um, they just agreed to do a five-year project with us on this. And um, the next thing we want to do is we want to do this broadly. So the, the, the Fab Lab movement started 20 years ago. Nigro Gershenfeld, someone I've you know, met many times. Uh, we have dinner when he comes to Berlin. Um, but the idea of the Fab Lab was that you're just putting smart machines into the room and then good things will happen. And for a while, we felt very superior because we felt like, ha, 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 we are smarter. It also takes smart software. And that's certainly true. But then we realized we, did, we ran a beta and we found that people didn't do anything particularly useful. Um, and so it, I think it, 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 at this point, we like, OK, we also have to deliver the content. And that's what we're doing right now. So we're actually creating content. Um, in like good projects, uh, ambitious projects, structural like furniture, uh, uh, airplanes is one we're designing right now. Um, it's kind of fun, like quick, quick voting. Who thinks the first thing will fly? If I throw it this way, is who, th who says this is a valid plane, this will fly? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay. And it's and, and not all of you had an opinion, which is interesting. And so it will not fly because it will start to tumble. And then you can ask yourself, what about the second one? Will that fly? You know, it has uh, it has the rudder in, right? It has a tailplane. And then, uh, well, you know, it doesn't need to stay. And then the third the third one does definitely fly. I can tell you that. And then you can go through like the same as I said, just talk about the guitar. You just every single time you just you you either make it work better or you just raise the bar. And then, um, yeah, but the trick is to actually have kids build like planes and just not build, like not as simple as that some, something that someone else has designed for them, but to actually design the, the thing end to end uh, on their own. And uh, there's uh, furniture coming up and um, yeah, stuff like that. I use it in class for electronics things, uh, and stuff like that here. Little robot races. So we give them, we, we can do reusable components and stuff like that. So anyway, so you know that's probably all I want to talk about. Um, there's two more questions. Tuning. Um, tuning. <clears throat> uh, that was yeah, probably an answer to a previous question you asked in the middle. About the guitar, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, tuning is interesting because I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing many of you know that. I mean, essentially, I, I apologize for being German. Johann Sebastian Bach kind of screwed this thing up. He just like, he just said like, let's, let's subdivide the octave into 12 equal steps with the upshot that you can play in any, any key. Um, but the downside is essentially nothing is in tune because harmony means rational vibration, fre uh, frequency relationships, and Bach 12 root of two is not rational, it's just irrational. And so when you play a regular guitar, it's always, everything is out of tune all the time, but it's pretty good. And it gives you some freedom. But that's a great thing to discuss because people have made fretboards on guitars that actually have just tuning. They're just not straight anymore. You just have all these weird things. And it's just really fun to have this discussion. If you're actually tuning your instrument, you, have, you can have a wonderful, like if you talk about the monochord, there's great ways of just exploring uh, frequency relationships. We're discussing right now to throw in a, mono, uh, a uh, harmonograph, which is plots these things and just to talk about what is harmonic. And then actually people could choose to have just tuning on the guitar, which is funny. And then they have frets that are just interrupted somehow and look completely screwed up somehow. Uh, you can't play bends anymore, obviously, but people choose to have these things. And that discussion is just really wonderful because you know it's not like someone tells you this is what the fretboard has to be like, but you actually kind of develop what the fretboard should be like. And you can you kind of make decisions that way. Uh, clarifying the thinking behind my question. Oh, okay. And last, I noticed uh, that miniature makers starting using circuit cutters. Uh, the, the instrument making aspect will also require their. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, these are great questions, Louise. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can say very much about this. I haven't really followed. But if you if you send me a link, I'll I'll make sure to look into that. Sounds sounds like something I should know more about. Um, and then the Hongji, Hong, how do you pronounce it? I'm not sure. Um, feel free to. Yeah, to... Hongyi. Yeah, Hong, Hong, or Hongji, or how do you say? Hongyi. Hongyi, okay. Yeah. Uh, how do you think the combination of mixed reality and person fabrication, similar to Iron Man, it's possible to lower the barrier for cat damage? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. I love, I think it's, I, I actually have some, in some slides, I have uh, that scene from Iron Man. 
And it's funny that whenever the, the world talks about virtual reality, they're always using wireframes uh, because other, otherwise they wouldn't even know that's not physical, right? I mean, if Tony Stark is there and does this thing and he reaches in and the thing follows his arm, they would think that that's actually is physical. Um, so number one, I think that in some ways, fab and VR and smart matter and Ubicom, and they're all converging to the same thing, right? It's some sort of the idea of a, it's some sort of a, like, a, like a, the whole, like everything coming together into some sort of a thing where you have control over reality somehow. Now, what VR traditionally, like VR traditionally was seeing and, and hearing, and then there's people start, like the, the, the physical aspect is slowly coming in, right? There's the idea of passive haptics, which also has been around for a long time, obviously. And then, you know, we did this human actuation with long pun where we have another person providing these things for you. And then there was a paper that does that with robots and stuff like that. And so in some ways, the, the physicality of virtual reality is, is that's, that's the weak spot of VR, if you will, right? The physicality, the weak spot of fabrication is the frame rate, like a frame rate of one frame a day is just not very good. Um, and, um, but I think every, all these fields, smart matter, you know, the swarms of robots, all that type of stuff, they all go into the same thing. They all come from the different angle and they have, they bring in their own weakness somehow. And in some ways, the, the, the whole, the question gets to the holodeck first somehow, where like <clears throat> you're, in a, you're in a room and you can just experience things as if they were physical, but under full computer control. And so one approach would be, but maybe you just fabricate and destroy very quickly, right? Um, Stephanie, I had a paper where we're using um, um, pet plastic materials that we, uh, that with tight couplings. So use a, use a tracker on your hand and you pull up and the material follows in real time. So if you want to, if you want to shape something, you can actually just move your fingers with a, with a tracking system on it and the thing gets shaped in real time. Um, other people think that li little self-organizing robots will get there. And, and, or maybe VR will get there first if, if people can figure out the, the force feedback component properly. You know, maybe it's electrical muscle stimulation or something like that, that gives you the sense of that happening. Um, what you're proposing is some sort of an earlier step, just using VR as a preview for that. I think that's, that's very fair. I think that's a, that's a fine idea. Um, we did a quick VR version of what I just showed. Um, we, haven't, we haven't maintained it, but we did a version where we just used, um, <clears throat> Uh, just the controllers, <clears throat> we had attached like some sort of a <clears throat> 20, cent 20 centimeter little virtual stick to it with a little ball in the end. And you could do all these manipulations. You could just place these boxes, you could drag and stretch. <clears throat> and we didn't even have to scale it. I think people were just very comfortable manipulating things at some five centimeter scale. Um, I think that would work. Um, mixed reality is obviously a little bit more ambitious because you have the tracking element with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think these are all cool and I think these are all going to happening. <clears throat> yeah, more questions question. if you feel like it. Yeah, please. I have a question. Hi, hi, Patrick. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question is um, related to Thai's project about the about the uh, portable uh, 3D printer that can print tools uh, for like a uh, in situations sort of a problem solving. <clears throat> Those type of uh, support systems actually works when, when you know uh, the solutions for your problems. The solution is a range of a particular size that you can define and, and yes. uh, it just makes it po uh, possible to solve it on site. And then uh, have you thought about, are there any situations where what people really need is actually they only know the problem. They don't know how to solve it with personal mm. fabrications. Uh, are there any thoughts that you have uh, have about uh, whether uh, personal fabrication could help with people uh, when they know about the problem, but they don't know how they can solve yeah. the problem? Yeah, that's, that's my I mean, question. Thank you. Yeah. So I fully second that. So what we did is in that in that paper. This is a. Yeah, we're gonna do a follow up where we're actually gonna show these very small machines that I mentioned, uh, because I think it helps people like kind of wrap their head around that, that transition. Um, we kind of recognized this at the time. And so in some ways that's, that's a separate field of like ex expert systems, if you will, right? So I've got the following problem, but I mean in, um, so what we actually, like, I mean, one thing is, I mean, the first thing is actually, I mean, what I today use is I use Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange or just Google for that matter. I mean, it's just Google has gotten really good at answering questions, right? 
if I say like, you know, why is COVID not going down in the UK or something like that? You know, it tends to extract stuff and answer a lot of questions for me. So in some ways, the, the, it's, it's some sort of a separable component and there's a good chance that the existing tools do this. What we did at the time is we actually, just for the purpose of the paper, we created this mini database and we put in, we just populate with 20 things. And three of them were actually different designs of Allen wrenches and a couple of other things somehow. So, and we did a tiny bit of indexing. I mean, whatever you, the indexing you need on 20 things. Um, but, but just to show the idea that yes, you would have something like Thingiverse or so on it where like you kind of, you know, um, in some ways what you're alluding to is kind of the vocabulary problem. How do I make sure that the, the terms I'm searching for have also been indexed somehow? And these are kind of classic retrieval problems like um, vocabulary problem being solved by the thesaurus and stuff like that. So um, yeah, Stack Overflow, Reddit, you know, these types of things somehow. But I think that's exactly what's gonna happen. So you, your question is right on. I think you would expect all these things that people use for problem solving in other domains, then also just to apply there. Um, that would be my sense, right? And then you would have voting systems and stuff like that, that will vote up the best solution and all those things that we've come to appreciate on things like Stack Overflow, I think. I think the shocker is just like, I think the, it's actually, the, the paper is not that visionary. If you think about it, it's just like, it just anticipates things getting smaller. That's not much of a prediction to make somehow. Um, it's just, I think the weird thing is just that no one has tried to make a small machine. It's, it's really interesting. Like, like so far, the 3D printers are just so unreliable at this point still, right? They're open freaking loop if you think about it. It's just like the 3D printer does not observe what it's, what it's printing, which is reasonably absurd if you think about it, right? It's printing for like eight hours straight and doesn't bother looking, checking in minute two if the material got stuck to the plate or not. It will be happily continuous seven hours and 58 minutes of some sort of a song and dance of this, you know, blowing plastic material into the space you know if they just like i don't know i'm having a hard time imagining that the 3d printer i'm buying in 20 years that that would still be open loop I, I would think that this has a sensor and at least tells me if the print doesn't work out rather than just doing that or ideally just you know fixing it somehow you know um so stuff like that so in that sense i think we're in this early stage where we the you know there's a hierarchy of needs somehow and and the needs at this point are like, yeah, I wish I had a machine that actually worked well. Um, we, we, the, the, the expensive machine we have is Stratasys machine and it produced a lot of jams for a lot of time. And the, we, we brought in the technician and he said, you're just not printing enough. The material sits in the machine for too long. It, it accumulates uh, moisture and it goes, so it, it has this, this, this metal tube when it goes through, it gets heated up in there. But if the material sits too long, it accumulates moisture. And at that point, the moisture evaporates and you get this muffin somehow and the thing gets stuck. And just the idea, like, I mean, if, if you've got a product and someone tells you you're not using it enough, it's supposed to run like every you know, multiple times a day and then it works, which it does, by the way. Um, you know, these are kind of, that's the world we're living in right now. So, but as researchers, I think the trick is to look over, the, look, look past these things. I think the best strategy to, in, to, to inventing is you just assume that everyone around you, all the missions that they're on, that they succeed, right? You don't join them in fixing the problems they're fixing. They're very good at fixing things. You know, every, every researcher around you, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, like if I need, if I feel like I need better retrieval system or, or you know, indexing or something like that, I'm just assuming that everyone who is, goes to a sick IR is, they're good people, you know, they're, they're gonna succeed. I'm just gonna assume they're all gonna do great. And I'm wondering what problem will happen if they all succeed. And that's where I wanna start. Now that said, we're fixing a lot of backend shit right now as well. I mean, we're like, we're looking at a lot of calibration things we didn't think we would be solving. We're talking to the laser cutter manufacturers and, uh, and but it comes like someone, like there's some things that just no one is doing somehow. And then we're solving those. But I recommend this as a strategy, you know, don't, don't like go to Kai or go to, um, like the VR conference? I don't know, where, what's your main conference? Where's the main thing? Are, are you going to Ismar, yeah. Ismar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can, you can build your research career and just seeing like, oh yeah, best paper award this year. This is cool. There's a good question. Let me address it. That's a good strategy. But you can also do it with a what if question. You say like, what if everyone who came to uh, Ismar this year, if they were all geniuses and they all worked out perfectly well, what new world would that create? And what does that world need? And then you start there. And I think that's, that's often a very exciting way of, uh, you know, 
90% probability that world will never happen and no one will ever hear of you again, but in the unlikely case that it will, you will look very smart. So. <clears throat> That's uh, definitely a good way to think about the future. I once I was, had a question about uh, the content and how you're focusing on building the content to help people build a guitar. At what point you would prioritize the co building a content over building new ways of fabricating something? Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, so we ran a beta. We've been running a beta for about two years now, I would say. And, um, but I've got a wait list of like 800 people or so would like to get a license and we haven't given any out. And to the dismay of the maker community, um, uh, the reason is, I mean, the purpose of a beta is to learn about your software and we learned pretty much all we needed for right now. And that sounds selfish somehow, but we are trying to make a product. So um, what I can tell you is if you're making a beta and you let people, like I can, we could actually go through the wrapper right now and look at the models. Everyone comes in. Well, think about what I said earlier about tech enthusiasts, right? They're interested in tools and they come in, everyone makes a box, applies a rounding to it, makes, adds a texture to it. Uh, adds another three boxes and leaves it in, in some ways because they have nothing to do. And so um, I'm randomly guessing if you let people use Blender or give them a VR, like ask them to design a VR experience, you know, I mean, look at the worlds they're doing. And um, so I may or may not write a paper about this, but we, 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 we're, we're adding something right now called unlocking. Um, as you, I think you may or may not have caught, I'm, I'm very inspired by video games. Um, I think, I think if, if you look at, if you look at productivity software, productivity software is way behind games. Um, games work way more reliable. Like if, if I think about floating figures in Word, um, you know, whatever decade, many decades after the introduction of Word, it's still not working properly. But if I look at some random, if I look at Minecraft, it's working, the software quality of Minecraft, obviously a simpler program is way higher. Uh, the onboarding experience of new users for games is way higher. The satisfaction of users is way higher. And so some of the ideas, you know, I'm working with some lawyer who doesn't know how to make a heading somehow in Word. And so somehow that person never, like that person's still using Word like a typewriter somehow. But in a video game, everyone arrives at, you know, the, the games train people along. They get you to the, they, they make sure you're doing the right things because they just, they have to have spoon feeding you increasing challenges as I just showed with the guitar, right? Rather than, and so the, the on like if I just say, here's a guitar, I mean, either you will completely fail or I show you how to do it and then you just didn't learn anything from it. I think that the, the idea of, of balancing games is very important. Right, balance, like flow, chicks and me high, the idea of like optimal experience by getting people always to the right level of challenge is very important. And so in some ways, throwing people into some software that just has a gazillion functions is just a really bad way of doing it. Video games don't do it. And I think productivity software shouldn't do it either. So what we're doing right now is um, at some point, people we let into the beta, they will be given one tool, which is the add voxel tool, which is the thing that just this does Minecraft building. And then from there on, they have to solve problems to unlock the next tools. And um, I'm sure people will, uh, be upset about that. Um, I don't mind. That's okay. Um, but I also think of this as unboard onboarding. So what's interesting is that I think the commentary I will expect is that say like, I've been the leader of the whatever Adler Fab Lab for twelve years, and who are you to tell me that I need to learn this tool? I know everything. I know Blender, like you know stuff. But but the truth is. The unlocking is the purpose of unlocking is not really to teach people the tools, but to teach them the application scenarios. So what I can tell after running that beta for like, you know, 18 months is that people that the makers, as I said, they just have nothing to do. So they're uninspired. They're not making anything useful. So I'll make you build a guitar stand and I'll make you build this and I'll make you build a table and a chair and things like that. And at the end of the day, what the maker community needs to be trained is they're good at doing tools. They just don't know what to do. So if you're running a beta program, I think you have to give people something to do, as silly as that sounds. And in that sense, I think like we're engineers, we love building functionality. If, if it were up to us, I mean, the whole team is excited. Like no one, the only person creating content is honestly me because I see that there's a necessity. 
everyone on the teams prefers building tools, right? I'm the person like, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. Um, every, yeah, of course. I mean, if you, we, Hustle Platinum Institute is the, the number one institute nationwide for software engineering. So we, everyone wants to build systems, it's great. Um, but I think dealing with content is very, very crucial. If you don't do this, I think you're getting stuck in some sort of thingiverse loop with um, like mostly embarrassing models and uh, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's weird. It's very strange. It, it's, it's not how we started. But, but I think we, we we're trying to keep our eyes open and I think that really makes a difference. Uh, these workshops, I think, have been big successes. Uh, we do the one on Cajons where we, um, it's a simpler workshop, obviously. Um, what we do is we let everyone, we give them a reference model in the end. Here's a standard Cajon. And then every one of them is allowed to make one modification to it, but they have to predict how they think this will affect the sound. Then we manufacture this and then we actually sample the sound and then we compare the spectra of the, of the reference cajon versus the one they made. And we debate sound, uh, sound production in, in these cajons and these drums. And you know, there's really something to be learned about it. And you just don't get that when people randomly build around somehow. So I think at least in the area that we're choosing right now, which is, which is education, um, yes, you actually have to do these things. It's weird because in research, no one I think is really interesting in writing this curriculum somehow. So I think, in, I don't know where VR stands on this, but I'm, I'm guessing that no, none of you says, oh, let me take a year off to kind of come up with good content somehow. That's just not what we're in for. We're engineers, we want to engineer somehow. But I think it really is something that the field needs. needs. I mean, traditionally, I think we just make tools and we're waiting for other people to come in, educators who would do that content stuff. We decided to do that own. That's, that's great. Um, there is a question from Luis about the waste would you like to to ask your question, Louise? Yeah, uh, with fabrications, anyone looking at the wasted issue? Yeah. Um, so if you look at the slides I showed you, one of them was sustainability, and uh, that that's essentially the chapter about this. Um, let me. Uh, so I should paste that link here. Oops. So here's the pub page, and then here, let me copy that link. Uh, copy link address. So here's the link to the to the journal paper I just showed. There's a chapter on that, on, 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 on sustainability and, and waste. So um, there's very little work on this. There's some very ad hoc work, which is the idea of filament recycling. So you 3D print something, and the idea is you kind of drop the the object into something that shreds it down. And I think everyone can, that's the obvious idea, obviously, right? You, you kind of recycle the material that way. Um, uh, in, in this chapter, we differentiate a little bit. I think one of the interesting things is, especially in this early phase where we are right now, I think many of the machines actually print less than they, than they weigh. So the machine itself is more waste than, you know, the tech enthusiasts, they don't print every day. It's not, they're not going to production and they're not making a small batch of something. Um, so I think upgradability of machines will be an interesting topic. And I think that's also something where we, we can look at computing, but I think we kind of largely failed. Um, you know, we, we buy these big computing boxes because they're upgradable and you can presumably replace the motherboard. And I'm sure like four of you have statistically, but you guys are not representative for the average population. No one replaces their motherboards. They just buy, you know, because that's expert work somehow to do. Um, so I think these are, these are actually interesting challenges. In that sense, VR is ahead in terms of trash, right? I mean, you guys also have that issue where you kind of buy a new device. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I mean if I just look at my lab, we got, I don't know, like eight different headsets, six different generations. Uh, I don't have a Quest 2 yet, but I, you know, I'm mostly annoyed about the licensing model, I guess. But, the, but arguably, you could buy a new headset every year, I guess, right now, the way this goes. Um, but you at least don't produce the, you know, your scenes are more easily disposable somehow. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that was a great topic to think about. I think it's an important thing. Uh, Stephanie and I did a paper where we talked about repairing things, which I think is, you know, it's sort of re reason that e perspective, but we did, we just, we took the 3D printer and we inserted a mill bit. And so if you're unhappy with your design or something broke, you put it in, it tries to analyze where the problems it mills down as little as possible. It's a five axis mill. So you can rotate the object to the right position, it mills off a little bit, but has to, you still have to 
middle of a hemisphere somehow, which is can be a lot. And then it 3D prints back on it somehow. So it's kind of cool in the sense that it reduces. I think the idea of a machine that repairs things is attractive. Now, what we what we showed there is somewhat naive, but I think the in the future, I think the idea that you have some sort of something that looks like a microwave or like a 3D printer for that matter, you put in an object, it figures out what's broken about it, looks up the construction plans and does some repairs, I think is very attractive. Um, it comes together at a time where like, at least I think in the EU, there's a law now that uh, planned obsolescence is bad and that, that uh, end users have to be enabled to repair. So, um, so that could be a direction. I think for, for a couple of years, this will be more, this will be more visionary, let's put it that way, and educative. It, to, to make this really practical, it's going to be very difficult to do. Um, but, but I think good research could be done at this point on this. Thank you. Um, anyone have has any other questions? We, um, in the lab here, in a few labs in the Auckland Bioengineering Department, we have been doing a um, few times 3D printing, and um, also we have a workshop with the milling machine. It's exciting to look into it. Um, yeah. I was thinking about the automatic versus manual, so how the, the Cube software uh, sort of make things easy for you to build things. At what point mm -hmm. people prefer, as a consumer, prefer to not not so much the coral draw, but a little bit more, you know, um, uh, dynamic or sort of a more programmable way of designing things rather than the automatic way. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, the the. Um... I think, I think one aspect is the, let me start at the end. So internally, I think we, I sometimes refer to Cube as the anti-maker software. And I think the reason why I think that is because tech enthusiasts in like, like challenges. And I know lots of people who are just very happy with themselves after having created a finger joint box or some equivalent, equivalent thereof. And we kind of, we, we, we're not good for these people. Right. <clears throat> Essentially, I mean, if you're very proud of yourself, maybe you have a Raspberry Pi and you made an enclosure all by yourself using a laser cutter. And that's quite the achievement. But it turns out in Cube, there's an asset for that. You just drag it in and there it is. Um, e even a repo for that matter takes some of the joy out because you could just use someone else's solution. So in some ways, um, so um, So what we have is we have an importer for um, we have an importer for for three D formats like Blender. If people prefer using that, I think that's a possibility. Um, in some ways, um, so in the beginning when we started the beta, I think there was some discussion about how to make makers happy, but we just decided that that's not our target audience. Maybe that's the simplest answer. Like in my, I mean, maybe also after writing that journal paper, I, I, I may come across as dismissive of makers, but let me be clear, I'm a maker myself, right? I'm, 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 I hope I'm a better maker in some ways because I've got a full engineering program behind me and you know, I'm, we, we make, we're pretty good at making, but we certainly love it. Um, but I also understand that making is some sort of a, it's a joyful experience that doesn't go anywhere. Um, I think in 20 years, if, if say 3D printing or laser cutting, any of these things have fully taken off, makers will still be makers. They will be doing exactly what they're doing today because they're not, do, they're not advancing the field. I think there's some sort of a catalytic element. If you think about the field, you've got this maker community. They're there and they're, it's, oh, it's cool, new. They love new toys. Um, and the, the world will pass them by somehow, will transition from industry to consumer use and the makers will stay where they are. They will find ways of, of creating challenge when there is no, they would say like, I'm gonna do it with one hand behind my back, you know, just to increase challenge somehow. And that's cool, I think that's valid. I mean, I've been to Burning Man twice, you know, I've been, you know, I think there's, there's something to be said about, you know, frivolous challenge somehow, I love it. I mean, it's like, 
you know, I just love, uh, I love the, the temples at Burning Man. I mean, I love, we, we went, we did a, I was still living in Seattle. We did a project of a, we brought a six freaking meter structure. We built this temple structure there. We did a, it just, I mean, not me personally, my friends organized the party together. They raised $10,000 and bought an obscene of these building materials and built this temple in the desert. I think that's awesome. But I think if you want to move the field to consumers, that's just a different mission. And, and I think in some ways, what, what's being, as I said, I mean, we publish papers now and then, but like the, it's not a research project, if you will. I really, I really want to make this happen somehow. And so, and so I think education actually has a real problem to be addressed. I haven't said that yet. The problem, let me tell you why this is good for schools. So schools, schools, live in an analog world and the kids live in a digital world and the schools don't like that. They're suffering from that, right? So um, the kids, they like on Instagram and you know all the 15 tools in TikTok and whatever it is, right? And you guys are old people because you still think that Facebook is a thing. Um, and I'm super old because I'm writing email most of the time. You know, every generation is a new toy and that's where they're disappearing into. And the teachers don't like that very much because they can't follow into that world, A, because they're also old, and B, because school has to deliver something tangible for like some sort of a, you know, university degrees afterwards. And so they have some obligations to stay in this physical world because they need to train people for some physical jobs afterwards. And so they suffer from this disconnect. And that dissonance is really very hard to bear for a teacher somehow, you know. Um, and what Cube does is the fact, what we always thought of as a downside, the fact that you still have to assemble this thing is actually a plus for them. So everything that happens in school starts with some sort of virtual designing and then there's physical building and they really, really like that. And so uh, we thought of like three, four or five different models of how we could move Cube forward. And yes, we talked about makers and then someone said like, yeah, we could charge people like nine bucks per month for a fab lab license and stuff like that. And, um, you know, we could use, we talked about using this for people in industrial design for rapid prototyping, all these things are they're vi they're viable, right? Um, but I think the school thing is ten, ten, tends to be the thing that at least right now seems to work out really well. You know, we're really addressing something that people need. We didn't know that in the beginning. This has been, we've been working with um, some very visionary principle. And um, so that's what we're doing right now. So in some ways, um, we I think the answer has been that we're not trying to make makers happy really. And it's not easy for us because we need to remind ourselves, right? There's obviously some of the meeting that we could do this and wouldn't be, couldn't do to that. And we get this email, we have someone in the beta program who really is a great person and we want to support that person. And, you know, um, so it's, it's interesting for me too, because as I said, that's the first time I'm really trying to do, get something into, you know, into that, into, to a bigger scale somehow. Yeah. How many, has anyone ever done a startup in, in the audience? Uh, we have a few people who are part of a startup. Yes. Um, who are part of a startup. Mm. Um, we don't is um, is a augmented reality startup. It's actually joined uh, with um, Mark Bellinghurst. Do you want to talk about it? We do. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Many work on. We have a small startup. Many work on the uh, augmented reality applications, but many of the low level technology that delivered to the companies that they will use that for the second three development build products yeah. on top that's all considered as a component. What's, what's yeah. the product? Uh, we did few uh, things before, but at this moment, the main focus is um, a 360 mobile platform that basically considered the Zoom Plus. So currently we just stuck ourselves in this small window. So video but if, just... Yes, if you have a 360 camera on your site, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll check the on our side, viewer side, we can freely and navigate ourselves and check the, you know, your kitchen yeah. <laughs> without the permission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, our main software things. Another thing that we're trying to start to work on is the hardware plus the software that to uh, combine multiple small uh, depth camera components and integrate yeah. into a. I can imagine. Are you, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's Very that's cool. that's a main task. Yeah. It's it's an exciting thing to do. I mean, I have to say, I, I was I was wondering what's the essence of being in research, and I somehow, like, I think all of us, we could have been engineers somewhere, and if we worked as engineers, every time we would have the satisfaction of doing something we're good at. 
And being yeah. research means we somehow all the stuff do stuff that we're not good at, right? Because otherwise somehow it wouldn't be research, right? So somehow we enjoy being incompetent most of the time. And I think in that sense, <laughs> trying a startup once or twice, you know, it's a wonderful new way of being incompetent. I can really recommend it. Um, <clears throat> complete new set of challenges that you haven't really thought of. And uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, don't do it. Don't do it before you have your PhD. Don't ruin your career. I'm not saying, oh, Mark, I'm just doing this. I'm actually working on my PhD only like 15 hours a week right now because we're doing this cool side project. Don't do that. That's not a good way. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So I think we are uh, above the one and a half hour mark. There is one question in the text it's asking about the oh, internal yeah, yeah. structure how do you scan internal structure if if that's uh, allowed yeah, how could you scan internal structures yeah um well we did one stephanie and i did a paper <laughs> i think that was rejected twice and then published in some obscure thing <clears throat> which we initially initially humbly called teleportation maybe that was the reason they got rejected um and uh and which is a lovely paper. I love this thing so much. So what we did is <clears throat> we were thinking about the, we were thinking about the value. Well, well, let me think about the different ways. Um, well, let me, let me start by answering the question maybe. So what we did is we, we built a machine. We also had a milling machine, the 3D printer, and we would grind it down one level at a time and take a photograph. So get a volumetric scan. Um, by the way, the field of 3D scanners is a mess. I don't know if you noticed, but like, if you just, if any, if anyone can tell me, I would like to buy a 3D printer that scans things that size and that works as well as the aforementioned toaster, I would kill for that. Like if someone wants to just type something to the chat window, what I should buy, that would really save me a lot of hassle. Um, my, my postdoc wanted to buy one, but it's one that still has a projector involved, costs $3,000 and it just doesn't look, does not convince me that it works like my toaster for that matter, I would love to have that. So, so we built this scanner for this project. We built a scanner that destroyed the object, but that was part of the program. So at the time we were investigating, Stephanie and I were talking about person fabrication and a good artist's perspective is, is to just, if you're doing X, to think about not X. And we were talking about destruction. So we had done a project where two people put money bills into the laser cutter, would shake an iPhone to make the laser beam, push it into the $5 bill of the other person, and the way of winning would mean that you take your $5 bill home and the way of losing would be like your $5 bill would be shredded that way. And uh, so we just had that, that wave of where we talked about person destruction somehow as a way, you know, personal fabrication is really about not losing stuff anymore. You can back everything up, you can multiply everything. So we wanted to think about loss for a little bit and, and we had a really good time. And this teleportation project was involved um, Imagine the following, scenario. just that's a wonderful pitch. Imagine, you know, your partner, your home, and your partner turns around. I think this works for men or women in, you know, slightly different ways. Your partner turns around and says, you know, uh, Quinn or Moritz or Haimo, you know, we've been going out for like, you know, two years now. I think you're the one and offers this little thing and, and there's a ring in it. And you're like, and then you look around, you see there's 20 identical boxes with rings behind that person on the counter. And you're like, that's odd, you know, why does this person have 20 boxes with the same rings? That's a little bit weird somehow. And so somehow certain things must be rare somehow. Like if someone makes something for you, you know, and that's also an aspect of makerism, I think, that's very special. And the fact that everything can be duplicated and that you can just like push the print button one more time and get a copy out is some sort of a weird thing, both from a legal perspective of owning this thing and from a perspective of, um, just not being unique and so we looked at how to how to make sure that an object is sent to someone that that it really is the only copy there is so some sort of a drm thing if you if you think about it and um so we created this machine you put the object in it it, it, it you first dip it into con con some contrasting fluid and then you mill it down like one level at a time it gets encrypted sent to the target machine and can be produced only once and uh, the reviewers just hated it um but but we probably just did a terrible job of like it was more some sort of an artistic feeling that drove that. And, uh, and the Kai reviewers were more like, what's the benefit for the user somehow? And that was maybe a little hard to explain. So, <clears throat> but we had such a great time doing it. Stephanie gave the most awesome talk ever because all the related work was art projects. So it was, you know, people have made things where, I mean, 
wonderful and terrible things like, you know, a blender with a frog in it at an exposition and people were invited to turn on the blender if they felt like it, you know? I mean, just killing and destruction or TV shows where people bring favorite objects get smashed on TV and stuff like that. And um, ah, I just, and I, and that was the most fun I ever had listening to someone's related work section, I really have to say. So anyway, so the question was just about scanning. Yes, I don't know how to scan things. I'm sure there's something with microwaves or so, right? I mean, different frequencies, um, you know, MR, MRIs. Um, the, the canonical answer to how to get a 3D scan is an MRI. Um, the idea is that you actually have, uh, if, you, if you've never looked at MRI, you have different um, pictures. You get 2D pictures from a certain direction and you do this from all types of directions. And the result is some sort of an equation system, right? You know what it looks like this way, you know what it looks like that way, you know what it this way. And then you have, for every voxel in space, you have an equation that describe the density of that spot. And then you solve. And that's exactly what happens when you go get an MRI taken at your doctors. And, you know, these things are expensive machines today. And obviously you can only get certain types of density, but I think the long run, I mean, you know, I don't see a reason why you couldn't have, well, and maybe it's a huge magnet in there, but you know, mm -hmm. I would I would think that that would happen sometime. Um, all right, three D printers don't do a great job in scan of scanning. Although the X Y Z Da Vinci three in one ah okay oh that's a recommendation for me. So I I checked the Da Vinci three in one, which I own is supposed to be one of the better ones. Okay, thank you so much. You just I got up at six thirty for you guys. And if that's the print I want to buy for 771 euros, thank you so much, Louise. All right, um, I'll report back if, um, oh, that would, that would make my life so happy if, if, that, if that thing worked. Uh, this reminds me of the 2006 film, The Illusionist. Yes, that was about teleport. So um, when, we, when we research teleportation, there's two ways of teleportation. One of them is, quantum tunneling by producing a wormhole and we were not successful at producing wormholes. And the other was, um, some, it was exactly what we did, some sort of destructing scanning process with recreation from new material somewhere else. And uh, it's just sometimes, <laughs> every community has some sort of shared values and the Kai community is a little bit humorless on the whole, I have to say. And um, the, at, at WIST, there was a paper about the nose pointing device by luminaries like such as Steve Feiner and maybe Andy Van Damme and like, I don't know, like important people kind of were on this paper on the nose pointer. It was published as a full paper and no one ever needed to mention the program that that was some sort of a not a serious paper somehow. But I think in the community, I think oftentimes, you know, they, they, if you, if you're a PhD student, if you, if you, if you get your PhD at that point, it's, it's a really important moment in your life because you've figured out how to do one type of research. But as you get older, sometimes you just get bored of that and you want to do a different perspective. You just want to mix it up a little bit. And then, but you submitted to a conference where the entire PC is staffed with people who just got, you're just in the process, you know, they just got their PhDs, they're kind of at that stage somehow. And they all have this very specific idea is, by the way, so did I for that matter, right? I mean, when I was, you know, 28 or something like that. I had a very specific idea of how I want this research. And every paper I reviewed, I reviewed, is, are they using my method, yes or no? And so sometimes it's kind of cool if you have some old farts on the committee because they understand, like, I always love Kelly Booth for that matter. This, he's retired now, but he's been old enough to just remember that there's, you know, lots of different ways of doing interesting research. And so submitting a paper on teleportation is probably, uh, we, we, you know, um, just, just to extract what you think, why that, you know, just to accept the fact that it could be interesting and probably produce some interesting discussion at the conference is, uh, I think it's probably a good reason for accepting it for that matter. But it got published ultimately, but, but certainly not as, um, I'm, very I'm very glad that the mobile fabrication thing was accepted. Even none of the reviewers believed that there would ever be mobile fabrication. It was very evident that we were like, they completely disagreed, but it um, would be great if stuff got accepted because of that, not despite that. So the prestige, yes, I, yes, it, yes. Uh, Haimo just says it's not the, but I totally know the movie that you meant. Yeah, it's, um, um, uh, what's his name? Wolverine, um, uh, killing himself Hugh, over Hugh and Jackman. over. What a fantastic yeah. movie. Hugh Jackman, yeah. We were at, you, we were at Kai like three years ago, whatever it was. And there was another event where Hugh Jackman was speaking and I just could watch my, my wife turned into like a squeamish 16 year old girl when she saw Hugh Jackman. So I will not forget that part. 
Oh, this is being recorded. Great. <laughs> hey, Katie. <laughs> All right. right. Is he like sexiest man alive or something like that? I forget. Um, so, <clears throat> anyways. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the talk, for sharing your thoughts and idea, for answering the questions and the interesting pers perspective that you add to us. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. This was we fun. look forward to meeting you one day when this COVID um, uh, passes away. But thanks again. I kind of like, I kind of started liking it the way it is, I have to say. I mean, I was, I'm really worried about climate change. I'm really glad that we got here for just yeah. a, you know, a couple of jewels of Zoom call. Yes, but more yes. sustainable and ways. Yeah. In Europe, we're like, you know, we're in Berlin. Um, it was brutally hot, but today we got a little of rain, which is very nice. Um, the newspaper just said that the temperature in Berlin could become like the temperature in Canberra. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> so. Well, I've been to Canberra once and, and uh, you know, so come quickly before that happens. That's good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone who attended the talk. Um, I'll speak to you soon. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And, Bye. you know, see you at one of the conferences sometime. Absolutely. Yeah? Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.